right, and with all that, welcome into the KSO Show. Mason Both, KSU underscore fan, and Drew Galloway from K-State Online and on three with you as we recap the Wildcats taking down the Frogs 41-3 to on Saturday in Manhattan. It's been almost a month since K-State had played a home game. They came back and kind of picked up where they left off, just beating an inferior Big 12 opponent with relative ease, although UCF put up a tougher fight, and at least they battled for – 38 minutes of that game TCU had zero fight in them from the start uh so that was uh probably not a great showing for them but good if you're a wildcat because K-State came out there and they didn't answer the quarterback question I think I, we can safely say that uh they probably made it murkier I think that was kind of what D1 and I surmised after the game last night it was like yeah okay they both played pretty well at times and it probably made things a lot tougher moving forward. And there are going to be a lot of questions as the season continues on because, and we'll dive into it in a little bit, but I, I doubt you're going to get an idea next week against Houston. If you did this to TCU, you should probably do something similar to Houston. And neither of those are going to get you prepared for what you have to be ready for in Austin. So we'll have to see how that goes. But for now, it doesn't really matter because it's focusing on a K-State win that was Pretty big and pretty impressive as the Cats get to five and two. So you heard Chris Kleiman at the start of the show there and uh, his comment on the quarterback situation. And that obviously is the the hot topic right now and will continue to be until something gets figured out there. So I'll uh, start with you, Drew. Immediate takeaways on first the quarterbacks and what Kleiman had to say, and then you can dive into some other stuff from the mm -hmm. game. Yeah, so to start with the quarterbacks, I mean – it's hard because it's hard to really kind of get a gauge for it when you win 41 to three. And, and like, I, I I've seen people kind of arguing about like which one played better. Like it, and, and again, that was 41 to three. I don't think it really matters, which yeah, one played I think better. It's, I think it's kind of a tough thing to make your case on, on who played better uh, <laughs> in that game yesterday. Cause I mean, they both had stretches where they were ineffective and they both had stretches where they couldn't be stopped, and they both did really impressive things. Yeah, and like it's also like when you run for as many yards as they did yesterday, I think it was like 340 in that range. Like, it doesn't really matter who is that quarterback because the offensive line played their best game of the year, and they really seem like they've kind of hit the ground running and they're hit their stride. So I, I think my biggest takeaway is that the offensive line looks like the offensive line that we thought that we were going to see the entire season. I mean, they the only sack that they allowed to was a, kind of a, a freshman mistake by Avery Johnson to take the sack. And I think it was like a loss of like 12, 15 yards and he could have just thrown it away. Yeah, it turned so, it into second and 23. <laughs> so, so the offensive line really turned the corner. I think that's kind of my biggest takeaway from the game. Yeah, the, the thing I'd add is is even historically, um, just as long as advanced stats have been around, which is 2007, this is one of K-State's top 5% games in that time span, which is pretty impressive considering you played two quarterbacks and you were playing a defense that was, in the metrics at least, the top 30 defense coming into the game. I don't think they will end up being that, but. Uh, 4.7 points or 4.9 points per drive, which is the fourth best in the climate era and the 12th best in 192 FBS games since 2007. So that's really impressive. Yardage rate was the third best in the climate era, 86%, which is ridiculous yardage rate. And it was the sixth best in 192 games uh, going back to 2007. So you have historical uh, high numbers in yardage rate. Uh, yards per play was also in the top 10, which is something we've been waiting for, that explosiveness, right? We've talked about that a lot. And this was one of the most explosive games K-State's had in the last 20 or 15 seasons. So a lot of things came together for the offense using two quarterbacks. So I agree with you. This this discussion of this quarterback was only good because of the plays, whatever. Um, some of the discussion I saw on Twitter and on the boards, it's like, guys, we <clears throat> had one of the best offensive games, period with two quarterbacks playing. So uh, that's, that's significant. Defensively, it was solid. It was one of the better, you know, one of the better points per drive games, 0.5 points per drive allowed uh, to, to, to a TCU offense, again, was top 30 coming into the game. Um, we wondered if we would confuse a young freshman quarterback again, and we did. 
and our freshman quarterback was pretty much unfazed. So really impressive on both sides of the ball for for K State's offense and defense to to dominate. Not not that I I, I did predict K State to score forty one points. I, I will say that in my prediction, but I scored I predicted TCU to score twenty four. So I was a little off on that one. Yeah, I mean I. I kind of thought TCU would at least score maybe a, a little bit more, not not like what they ended up doing. Um, if you think about how things have gone this year for, for K-State this season, they now have the UCF game where they went over 500 yards in this game, and this game ends up ranking as the, the fifth most yards ever put up in a game in K-State history. Um, that's, that's pretty impressive, and I, I talked about it last night, like, you know, in a year where it feels like there are these questions and things have gone wrong, the offense is still doing some pretty impressive things. And I think it's a testament to Colin Klein and, and what he's been able to do and how he's just kind of changing things uh, at, as the offensive coordinator. I mean, people talk about well, what's wrong with the receivers. Well, it's because under the old offense, they couldn't get a receiver to want to come and play here. And that's why the last, you know, the first real, this is year six, right? So, the first or four or five, whatever. The first however many years of Chris Kleiman being at K-State, his leading receiver is going to be a Bill Snyder recruit. Like, a guy that came in right there at the tail end of it. I guess maybe Phillip Brooks, and you'd have to go back and look to see because he was the class of 2018, so maybe he was a Kleiman guy at the very end. But that's what they're relying on. So they are relying on a guy that in 2018 was came to K-State. Before that, it was Dalton Schoen in year one, and it was you know Malik Knowles and all this. They they haven't been able to get guys to come. That is starting to change, as we saw last night with Jace Brown, who had an impressive night. So the the offense has its issues, and we we documented those very well last night. Though they played another great game, and Colin Klein continues to do really good things. And honestly, probably the the only thing that you can fault him on this year is that first drive in Stillwater that just looked mm -hmm. strange and not like any of the others that we've seen this year. Because every other game, they've started with a touchdown this year. And so I don't know what was off. And I think it's just more of an indication that the game that happened in Stillwater is not really who K-State is. Because not only were the players off, but it's clear that the coaches were off in that game too. Um, and they probably overthought some things. They, they were probably confused with the week off and seeing Oklahoma State look different. So things are uh, moving in a positive direction for them but the quarterbacks they will be uh, the discussion as we move forward Chris Kleiman you know said that Will Howard was the unquestioned leader did not say he was the unquestioned starter and I think maybe gets his words twisted a little in there because it kind of conflicts on if you know is is it not going to be a two quarterback system the rest of the way or how often are you going to use these guys I would venture to guess that in every game the rest of the year we're going to see both quarterbacks unless Will Howard reverts and it gets so bad again, and then they just turn the team over full time to Avery Johnson. But for as long as Will Howard is playing at a level to where he can survive and play for K State and help them, then we're going to see both quarterbacks. I feel pretty good in saying that. Um, last night, here's a look at what they did against TCU. I mean, fairly similar in terms of how they end up grading out. ESPN's QBR gave Will Howard a 97.5, Avery Johnson got a 91.5. Both at times made some really good throws and both had stretches where it didn't seem like they could hit anybody and, and kind of had a lull. Um, but they both came out, were impressive, and led scoring drives down the field. So now that we've you know kind of established the situation here and uh, we we've all have decided that you can't necessarily determine who played better last night or who was the best and anything – how would you guys break down the quarterback play last night and who played better? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I think that it was, it was pretty <coughs> even for the most part, honestly. I mean, in a game where Casey punts one time, can, can you really say who played better? I, I, I will say that if you gun to my head, like if you said that both quarterbacks were combined for like two, I think it was 244 passing and about 150 or 140 rushing. I mean, you're going to take that every day of the week. So like it, it, it was more of Colin Klein kind of pants the TCU defensive coordinator the entire game. 
I, I don't think TCU thought that it was legal to throw to a running back, which is funny because Dylan Edwards went crazy in week one. So you'd think that they'd have that figured out. And I, I think that case, it actually saw that because they, they ran a lot of concepts that were similar to what Colorado ran week one to get the running backs open. But I mean, it, I, I don't know who played better. If you made me throw out who I thought played better, it's probably Will Howard because of the amount of touchdowns that he had. And, and he gets kind of the added advantage of Avery Johnson was the quarterback that was in when K-State had to punt. So, I mean, I, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's close. Um, I think non-garbage time... I'm guessing Johnson may have had a slight edge in points per drive on drives he was in. Um, Howard ended up what counting for 216 total yards rushing and passing. Johnson 163 total yards rushing and passing. So both both had good moments. I think I think you know we go back and talk about that stretch kind of in the second quarter. They had eight straight incomplete passes. Um, before that was really good. After that was really good. Um, so it was really that stretch and it was both quarterbacks. Both of them had a drive in there where, uh, we, we kind of scuffled a little, little bit, the passing game, R- running game kept going well, but overall, you know, both guys playing well, you know, I think it's something, uh, K-State will be able to do again next week against Houston if they want to rotate the guys. But, but I do think one of them will have to emerge probably in, in uh, Austin for K-State to win. And I don't know if the two two quarterback system it can do it but who knows i mean it climbing has done some interesting things and and this may just be another one we'll see football is football and both That's guys right. appear that they can play it right now yeah look i will we'll definitely talk about it next week after the game with you know have they figured it out and, and how important is it to have a a specific guy in mind i i think as of now it, you have to go into that game with a pretty clear and concise plan and just expect this is the guy and ride with him for a bit but last night and i i, I think chris Kleiman was truthful when he said it and it's that k-state didn't go into that game planning on alternating every drive with those guys at quarterback but it worked the first two, so they were like, well, Will doesn't deserve to not be out there, so he'll go back out there. Another good thing happened, and then Avery let him down the field. They had to settle for the field goal, but like they just kept moving the ball and, and finding ways to be successful, and so it was just like when then the defense stepped up, and so the lead was big enough to where it wasn't so important to keep just stacking good drives. You could feel things out a little bit more, and so it just made sense last night, and I mean – theoretically you should be able to do that against Houston, but believe it or not, I mean, I wouldn't, I doubt anybody would have thought this at the start of the year, but Donovan Smith is going to be the best quarterback that they play in this now four game stretch that they're on. Uh, Alan Bowman, Baron Morton, Jake strong, and, and then Josh Hoover it Donovan Smith is probably the best guy out of there. And people, people know this. Some people hate that. I bring it up. Houston's receivers do kind of scare me for, for what happens there. But then again, that's a defensive problem. So, you know, I think the quarterbacks went out. Both of them played well. I would probably give the edge to, to Will Howard just because I think uh, he he came out – with all the pressure that would have been on him to feel like he needed to go out there and play well to get that job back, even if, like, he won't outwardly say that. Internally, that's what he had to be feeling last night. Like, that game, it's not the biggest of Will Howard's career, but in terms of, you know, keeping his status and his job – it was one of the most significant of his career and he came out there and not only did he not mess anything up, but he played well. He, he did good things last night for K state. So um, it was huge for him and, and we'll see how it goes moving forward. But I mean, the quarterback thing is going to be a, a big deal moving forward and we'll, we'll keep monitoring it. One of the things though, that played a significant role in the quarterbacks having success was Jace Brown. But outside of Jace Brown, the receivers still had their fair share of struggles last night, and it also got a lot worse. I think you could see a pretty dramatic shift. K-State struggled for a stretch of throwing the ball when Ben Sennett left the game with an injury, and it just opened things up for the TCU defense because so much emphasis has to be put on to Ben Sennett that when he's not out there, it's just kind of like, yeah, okay, whatever. We, we don't have anybody we have to really worry about. 
fortunately, Jace Brown stepping up. So, Drew, I'll, I'll let you lead off again here. You can talk about how good Jace Brown was last night and what that means moving forward, but also uh, where the rest of the receivers are and, and what needs to go down there. Yeah, Jace Brown was massive last night. That's the most uh, yards that our receivers had in a Power 5 game this year for K-State with 88 as a true freshman. And he he just has an element of speed that I don't, I don't think that you necessarily get from some of the other receivers in the in the room and, and we've heard we've heard about that the last i think two or three weeks now where you kind of heard that he's coming along he had a little bit of a setback before oklahoma state which looking back i i bet that they wish they would have had him for oklahoma state yeah. but he played really well um he was hilarious in uh the post game because somebody asked him about like the the touchdown catch that he had and he said I don't really know what happened. I just blacked out, <laughs> which is which is the funniest like eighteen year old first touchdown answer. Uh, but the other receivers did struggle. I mean, we we all said in the press box in the first half when Keegan Johnson got that jet sweep that they need to scheme up more touches for him because when, when he gets touches he looks explosive. It's the, it's just the issue is he's just not getting the touches. But but there was also on that first drive, I think it was the third or fourth play of the game where Keegan Johnson just absolutely blew by his guy and Will Howard just didn't see it. Mm-hmm. So yeah. the, I, I wonder if that throw goes to Keegan Johnson and he scores, like what happens from there with him? Because after that, it seemed like he kind of disappeared. And then Jaden Jackson didn't have a catch. Phillip Brooks only had three. It was... It's just an up and down game from the receivers again, hoping to get more consistency as the season goes on. Hopefully, maybe they found something with Jace Brown. Maybe one of the other freshmen is ready or ready enough to be in the spotlight. So it, it, it's interesting to monitor going forward again. But I, I mean, if Jace Brown wants to be the guy, I, I don't think anybody's going to stop him. Yeah, well, you, you mentioned the – so Keegan Johnson ends up not with a, a single catch yesterday, and we thought maybe they would try and force feed him. But I think we've thought that basically every game now when he's been out there and been close to 100% because y- you need somebody to step up, and Jace Brown did it. And on the topic of missing guys, I mean, Avery Johnson missed Garrett Oakley wide open down the middle of the field at one point. He made up for it, though, with a big pass to Jace Brown to pick up the first down later on that same series. But um, – it. It, the receivers continue to struggle, and I, I'm with you. I think you said it well there, where you know maybe it's not necessarily that they're ready, but like they're close to being ready or they're ready enough. And you can't tell me that if you put like Trey Spivey out there right now, that he couldn't do exactly what you know will like what. Philip Brooks did last night three catches 31 yards or you know what we've seen from Jaden Jackson or a lot of these other receivers like you're not getting much production there you might as well try it with somebody else and especially if Avery Johnson's going to be out there some more put some of the guys out there that he's going to have the best rapport with and I think that's what we've seen like Jace Brown the last two weeks has made plays and outside of the catch that he got from Will Howard I mean, his his biggest catches, probably three of his four biggest catches so far this year, have come from Avery Johnson's arm. So I, I think that's something to to look into going forward. And if you're case and Chris Kleiman, you have nothing to lose by playing some of the younger guys right now because you can try something different. You're not going to lose anything, uh, any production basically if you you don't have Jaden Jackson out there uh, for the same amount of snaps as he's been getting. And that's not a shot at Jaden Jackson. I think Jaden Jackson has actually played played fairly well this year, given the circumstance and and what where I perceive his talent to be. But it's more of just a, a status report on where K State is right now. I mean, I, I get that, but I think there is a, a factor of how much offense those guys can run compared to the guys that have been here for a few years. Um, so I do think that factors in, and, and you're still you're talking about probably the second best offense in the big 12. So some of our comments sound like we're talking about an offense that's scuffling at 12, but this is the second best offense in the big 12 and big 12 games only, only behind Texas and points per drive and the yardage rate, touchdown rate. So they're doing some good things there. I, I do think your point about 
Brown and Johnson having some chemistry, probably because they've been playing together all fall. I think that's a factor. I think we saw the the one thing we can I, I would say based on this game is which quarterback has the best touch on a deep throw. That would be Avery Johnson in this game. Those two throws to to Brown were both single coverage. He he had his band beat, but not by a lot. And Johnson laid both of those balls right in there over his outside shoulder in stride, where only he could go get it. Uh, but like we talked about during the game, Drew, they weren't like super hard catches because it was right where it needed to be. So you got to give him credit for that. So that's that's pretty impressive. Um, I know Ben Sennett did get hurt, but who would have thought tight ends would catch three balls and <laughs> none of them would be Ben Sennett. So that factors in as well. So the tight end, I thought both young tight ends showed well in the game, especially when Sennett went out and it seemed like the offense really didn't skip a beat without him. So I thought that was significant as well. So we're going to get those guys involved. Um, Brooks kind of did his thing as, as the guy that kind of has a knack for getting open short and, and got some balls thrown his way. But you're right. We got to have more from the Keegan Johnson. Good point, Drew, on the first one. If we makes that throw, even if he makes the throw on time to Philip Brooks, who was open on his break underneath, um, and it's not incomplete, maybe we're talking differently as well. So it is, is it is an issue, but it's – it's a good issue to have when your offense is still clicking pretty good in Big 12 play out, you know, really outside the Oklahoma State game. And even with that game, it's still the second best offense in the league um, in just Big 12 games only, which, you know, to me is pretty impressive when we thought <laughs> we've we've complained a ton about the offense this year and it's still scoring three point something points per drive in Big 12 play, which is not easy to do. Which I think is probably just another testament to Number one, they played a very good team on the road in Missouri that was highly motivated, and they, K-State did not play poorly in that game. They just didn't take advantage of a couple of opportunities, but they've done it now against a team that, what, is six and one? And, you know, in a couple of weeks, they, they'll they they'll get to see where they're at when they go down to Athens and, and maybe battle Georgia for the SEC East. And then, you know, the Oklahoma State game was just a bad game, and, and we kind of thought that at the time, um, I, even though – there had been questions up to that point throughout the season and some things had looked a little shaky. And so it was like, well, then this is just the game that everything manifested in it and it's telling of what's to come. In reality, it was just, it was bad. Everybody will play a bad game during the course of their season. And sometimes you get lucky and it's against a team you can hand. Oklahoma got lucky yesterday that they got yeah. UCF who might be the worst team in the league right now. Texas, has maybe gotten lucky a couple of times this year because it could have happened against Houston, could have happened against Wyoming. It could have happened in a lot of games for them. And for K-State, yeah. it just happened on a night where Oklahoma State, they're starting to play better, but they've played probably their best game of the year. No, and, and you – I mean, I was just looking at schedules. Outside of Oklahoma, Texas, and K-State, the team with the best chance to go to Arlington is Oklahoma State right now, looking at their schedule. Their toughest game is Bedlam, and anything can happen in that one. Other than that, they – they play some of the lower level teams in the league. So they've got just as good a chance to finish uh, seven and two in the league, maybe even eight and one and, and get to Arlington. And this is a team we all thought was dead and gone and, <laughs> and, and was going to be an afterthought in this league. And now all of a sudden I would, you know, I don't think West Virginia is great, but going there and then putting them away the way they did yesterday, yeah. I know we'll get to big 12 play Oklahoma state's, a lot better than I thought they were. And, Drew, you know, Drew, I think, gave your apology last week. I'm, I'm giving mine right now. <laughs> I mean, I thought Mike Gundy was a season away from being fired. I thought it was just yeah. like, dude's lost touch. There's no way he can survive. And now all of a sudden it's just like, well, uh, actually, he's just as good of a coach as he's ever been. It just took, a you know, a lot to get there. Probably a very – I mean, Oklahoma State fans have to be really frustrated right now considering – I guess they really only lost what they only lost the one non-conference game. Yeah. But they looked like yeah. crap against their FCS opponent in Arizona State, and they lost was bad Iowa to State. start the year. Yeah, and they lost you, Iowa State. So you always hate that. So yeah, yeah. I think every team in the Big Twelve has a tough time adjusting to losing to Iowa State and KU. Still, um, like I, it's just you have no idea how to respond to it. I mean, I, I said it at the time, and it, it it was kind of like a coping mechanism to say that the that the buy kind of came at the right time for Oklahoma State, but like it actually might have came yeah. at the perfect time. Yeah. yeah, it did for them, for sure. 
Um, and yeah, K State just unfortunately might have been the right time for K State outside of the fact that they had to play Oklahoma State, who had it come at the right time for them too. Um, one other thing, real quick, on the tight ends that you mentioned, fan. I mean, they could have had two touchdowns last night. Garrett Oakley had the one get called back, um, yeah. but yeah, the, both of those guys were good. And the receivers last night, and this is probably something to track. They had less than half of the K State catches in the game. Four from Brown, three from Brooks, none from anybody else. So just something to, to kind of keep in mind uh, as we move forward. Defensively last night, we'll hit on this just real quick and uh, kind of take a, a peek at it. I mean, they played well. They, they didn't allow much from TCU. I thought in terms of being able to just go out and get stops that helped continue momentum and build it up and give the offense a chance to get back out there and put up more points and distance yourself early – it's easily the best they've been all season because they have eventually gotten there in games. But if you think about the game in Columbia, the game against UCF, the game against Texas Tech, it took a long time to actually get to that point. It took a half, essentially. And last night they did it from the jump. I think TCU ran four plays on their first drive. Then they punted and K-State went down and scored. And by the time TCU had finally scored it, they got a field goal, which K-State I mean, Will Lee, get his individual grade is an F just for that pass interference call that he got, uh, preventing a another punt there in case they maybe being up 21 nothing. I'm half joking there. Um, but the defense played well. They, they got enough pressure on Hoover. And, I mean, this dude threw for over 400 yards last week against BYU and last night was kept to 183 on 43 attempts or 187 on 43 attempts. And Purnell got the pick. So, the defense stepped up last night. They played well, and obviously this is a team that with all the inexperienced guys, they're starting to, to figure things out more and more as things move along. Uh, what did we make of the defensive performance last night and what it means moving forward? I, I was I was impressed with you know how they kind of took – there were several drives where they kind of took a shot and recovered. You know, that second drive, TCU has a 35-yard run, 16-yard pass. You think, oh, here we go. We're giving up chunk plays again. They – uh, stiffen up and hold them to a field goal. Uh, TCU's fourth drive, the first four plays went seven, seven, eight, and four. They're playing fast. It's hard sometimes when the offense is playing fast, gets to the rear of them. You think, well, here they go. K State stiffens up, forces a punt. Even the drive after halftime, K uh, TCU went seven, 16, seven, 14, seven, seven, two, had a drive going. And then again, they stiffen up and hold them, uh, hold them on downs really to put the game away at that point in time. So uh, just, several times where they kind of took a punch early in a drive and then those three drives only led to three points for TCU. That's pretty impressive uh, against an offense. Like I said, like you said, you know, that kid had thrown for 400 yards um, really good job of again, dialing up some pressures, um, forcing him to, to not throw with his feet set hardly ever always on the run. And then taking away a pretty good running back and, you know, he got the one chunk play and a couple other decent runs, but, Overall, really impressive to hold that offense to to 0.5 points per drive. It's, I think, again, you know, we TCU. I think the metrics lied to us a little bit going in. I don't think they're a top 30, top 25 team like they were in about every metric. But they're going to win some ball games at the end of the year. Probably, probably be a bowl game a team. I think maybe six or seven wins. So, very solid performance by the defense to do that. I will also say this. I mean. The, the performance last week isn't totally fraudulent from Hoover because, as was showcased last night, the BYU defense doesn't just let any freshman quarterback throw the ball all over the place on it. You at least have to have some talent. Uh, so Josh Hoover at least has that because Jake Strong did not have it again last night. We'll talk about that more at the end of the show because uh, what a rough start to college career for that guy. We thought Will Howard's start was bad. He at least won his games to start. And, you know, I mean, this guy losses and just turnover after turnover. He's handing them out like Oprah. So, Will Howard for, won at TCU. Yeah, you know, exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right, Drew, uh, your thoughts on the defense. <laughs> um, it was the best of the defense has played all year, I think. Uh, they shut out Zemo and only held Troy to 13, but I think that that's the best of the defense played all year. They really limited the explosive play, too which, I mean, a uh, fan hit on a few of them that they allowed, but I think they only allowed three or four the entire game. Mm -hmm. 
So it, it was the best that they limited the explosive play. They got constant pass rush. They hit Hoover a lot. I thought that the corners played exceptional. Keenan Garber probably had his best game as a Wildcat. I thought Desmond Purnell had his best game at K-State. And, and it seems like that they're kind of coming together at the right time. I mean, they, they've allowed three touchdowns in the last eight quarters. And, I mean, I mean, you can go back further, and they only allowed one offensive touchdown against Oklahoma State. So they've allowed uh, four touchdowns in the last 12 quarters on mm-hmm. defense. So it seems like they, that I think that the bye week – we just talked about it. The bye week might have came at a good time for the K State defense because it seems like they've started to figure it out. And Jacob Parrish played well last night, too. I think all three safeties are starting to come into their own. It's just that everybody is kind of gelling at the perfect time. Uh, real quick, this is a question that, that both of you can answer. You guys are mo- much smarter than me on this, so I'll defer to you guys. Should we be concerned at all? And I guess, I mean, it's not really the same thing, but drives that felt like you could have really broke the will right then and there. The K-State defense committed some game-changing penalties. Willie's pass interference, not as bad as what happened for Jake Clifton in Lubbock, but somewhat similar situations where the offense has actually put you in a position to, to put the game away early and a missed opportunity has come because of a penalty. So is this something that is just dumb, bad luck, or is it something where, you know, the K-State still has some issues and it just pops up in a time where you feel the the pressure and you're maybe a little frenetic about how you're trying to play? I, I'd, I'd say a mix. I'd say there's part bad luck in there. There's part, um, I think they do coach these guys to be aggressive and especially when you have so many inexperienced guys, you're going to have an inexperienced guys make an aggressive mistake in a game um, that that kind of can hurt you. You know, and you know Clifton's was kind of a fluky yeah. deal last week. That the pass interference was in some ways maybe even a little bit fluky as well. Grabbed him a little bit. Ball was probably overthrown. So, but but I I think the I think that aggressiveness and pushing that aggressiveness is the proper way to go long term it's just going to give you it's going to get you caught a couple times and i think we've seen that throughout the climbing era some defensive penalties which um are a result of being over aggressive i thought you were going to say which which bill snyder teams would have never have done no <laughs> especially, I, I especially in 1.0 people forget that a <laughs> yeah. lot i i just think that that's just the thing that happens like I mean, like fans said, I've seen hits that Jake Clifton that like that Jake Clifton hit that don't get called for targeting, yeah. and sometimes they do. So I mean, yeah. it happens. And I, the the more concerning thing I think for the Will Lee penalty is that he probably didn't need to grab him. Mm-hmm. So that that's probably something that they can just correct it with technique and everything. So I I think that it's fine going forward. Some sometimes it's just bad luck, you know. Yeah, well, I'm just trying to erase bad luck from the game. I'm trying to make them a better team, Drew. I, you know, don't, don't, don't put that on me. All right, uh, let's roll in now to our uh, college football outsider a little bit earlier because uh, this will tie into one other big topic that we'll talk about with K State. But yesterday in the Big Twelve, almost close to a full slate of games happening. We're getting closer to every team being done with their bye weeks. Actually, TCU still has to have theirs, so we're not all the way there yet but we are getting to that point uh in terms of play yesterday we can go game by game in a little bit but which performance stood out the most to each of you and fan you can uh, have first crack at this Uh, honestly byu you know being the second newcomer to be the legacy school you know even though mason you don't quite count some of these legacy schools um, I which I get West Virginia sort of not kind of. So that was probably the biggest surprise to me. I thought T I thought Texas tech would play a little bit better, but you know, you pointed out how bad the freshman quarterback played. And I think that was a big factor because there was some major mistakes in that game by Texas tech that really hurt them. Um, outside of that, you know, I don't know how much credit you give to Houston and UCF for, playing Texas and Oklahoma close. Uh, they, both of those games were much closer than I anticipated. So I, I do give them a little bit credit, but in the, at the end of the day, they still lost the games and it 
probably was just as much Texas and Oklahoma overlooking those schools a little bit because they're human as anything. And then, you know, Baylor getting another win. You know, they beat two of the new schools now, so they're still at the bottom of the Big 12 in nearly every category on offense and defense. <clears throat> so they're not a very good team, but they're managing to beat teams that they should on their schedule. So I give guess give them credit for that, but that's another thing. And uh, so those would be the, the, the BYU one would be the one that sticks out the most. That was, I did not expect them to win that game. Yeah. I'll, I'll just say that Cincinnati might be like awful, awful. Like, I kind of thought that when they lost to Miami of yeah. Ohio. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> like now, now that Virginia has like a competent, like big win, Cincinnati might be the worst power five team. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's probably fair. And what's, what's weird about Cincinnati is they've played basically close games with everybody. They've been around game, every game they've played in the big 12. It's just, they are one of those teams that there's enough talent there to hang around, but there's enough that's wrong with them that they're never actually going to get over the hump and win those games. And what's wrong with them is Emory Jones. Emory Jones yeah. is not, a winning quarterback. He has proven that when he was at Florida, when he was at Arizona State, and for some reason Scott Satterfield thought that it could work for him. It's, you know, it's that meme from Arrested Development where Tobias is talking about like, you know, something and his, his wife goes, "Well, has it worked for any of them?" and he's like, "No, but maybe for us." You know, like that's <laughs> that's what Satterfield was thinking with with Emory Jones. So, I just well, think I check, think it's one of those bad deals where they're just they're not going to get over the hump against anybody this year. Yeah, yeah. Check these numbers. Cincinnati's at one point three points per drive in Big Twelve play. They have scored touchdowns on twelve percent of their drives, and they have turned it over on twelve percent of their drives. So, not not real good to have those kind of numbers on your efficiency stats. Yeah, no, not not good at all for them. And uh, Baylor is kind of the opposite. Well, not really the opposite, but they're at least the team. As much as I think that Dave Aranda is a fraud, and I continue to be proven right in that, uh, he at least is still not like bad enough and have a bad enough team to where he can't handle these teams that he should beat. Like you said, like yeah. I couldn't believe that Cincinnati was a three and a half point favorite yesterday. I mean, that back to back weeks, you could have made some easy money with Iowa state and Baylor money line, because for as bad as we think that those teams might end up being, it's clear that Cincinnati is not going to beat a team that has any level of competency whatsoever this year. Like you're going to have to work really hard to lose to Cincinnati. And I just like, I, and Cincinnati should be lucky because outside of Oklahoma, they have not really had to play anybody yet this mm -hmm. year that should strike fear into them. It's going to get real nasty for them in a little bit because they have to go to Stillwater next weekend. Uh, Oklahoma State's going to want to put up points galore on them. They have to still play KU at the end of the year at home. I mean, KU is going to kick their butt. And they are lucky that they have UCF, Houston, and West Virginia in between those games. But even West Virginia, they, like they go to Morgantown, there's no shot that mm -hmm. they win there. So Cincinnati is just – that. that is a team right now that I am uh, not about. I think that they are – uh, kind of idiots, and and we'll see how it goes from there. Um, there, there you go. There is the uh, the meme, just so everybody has the reference point for you there. Uh, so, so is Travis Kelsey going to wear a new mascot hat every week to press conferences? <laughs> that would be funny. I mean, that would be awesome. What, does he have a Baylor teammate right now? We'll have to, we'll have to get a check on that and see. Uh, I, I also, I also want to give a non Big Twelve shout out to Nevada probably the worst FBS team this year and they beat Brady Hoke who oh, oh god yeah, Brady Hoke is <laughs> proving that what happened to him at Michigan can happen at any level because I, they look bad at the start of the season in week 0 even though they beat Ohio and they've continued to not look great that loss to Nevada is terrible he he's proving that uh the like year and a half that he's had at San Diego State that was good that was just a fluke how do you not score against the worst team in the FBS? But yeah, I just wanted to give Nevada a quick shout out, you know? Impressive. Uh, for me, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give the the nod this week for my most impressive Big 12 game to Oklahoma State because there was at one point there where when West Virginia kept hanging around and it was a tight game, I thought I was going to look like a real idiot for thinking that Oklahoma State would go in there and, and win that game. Um, but like fans said, they just figured out. And Ollie Gordon has – 
officially just taken the mantle as best running back in the Big 12 uh, for what he was able to accomplish yesterday. So if you're watching on the YouTube, there's a look at the games on your screen. If not, UCF and Oklahoma played a heck of a game uh, to start off at 11 a.m. UCF came up a two-point conversion shy of maybe forcing overtime. Baylor, they beat Cincinnati by a field goal in that disgusting game that we've talked about. Basically, any gross game this year has involved Cincinnati in the Big 12. Oklahoma, or Baylor. Or Baylor, yeah, good point. Oklahoma State beats West Virginia 48-34. to Houston gives Texas a game, 31-24. to The Longhorns survive down in Houston. And then BYU beats Texas Tech 27-14. to Tech was never in that game. And then K-State, speaking of another team that was never in that game, TCU gets beat by the Wildcats 41-3. to So those are all the Big 12 scores. Uh, UCF and Oklahoma probably surprised a lot of people. It certainly mm-hmm. surprised me because I did not give much credit whatsoever to uh, what UCF could show up and do. And I don't know if this is the type of deal where we talk about bye weeks and when they come. might have been bad for Oklahoma to have a bye week right after beating Texas and sitting around, and now you get two weeks to just kind of rest on your laurels and say, yep, we're, we're that good. Look at us. Here we go. And they came out. They didn't look great. And they just, I mean, everybody has scored on UCF this season, and Oklahoma just took forever to finally get going. I mean, they scored 14 points in the fourth quarter, but, I mean, 189 rushing yards is not a bad number by any means, but against UCF, you're certainly giving up shots to the field, basically. You know, if, if this was the PGA Tour and we're talking about strokes gained putting, you know, the uh, teams are knocking down putts at like an 80% rate on UCF. Oklahoma was at like a 55% rate yesterday. Not very good uh, relative to how the, the course is played with the Knights. Yeah. Um, just, go ahead, Drew. Oh, I was going to say, it's just crazy how – Oklahoma, how bad Oklahoma looked last night or yesterday morning. And also, like, UCF's two-point conversion play never had a chance. So when when OU took the score to go up by eight, I was listening in my car on the way to Manhattan. I shut it off because I was like, okay, I know that UCF is not going to be able to get both the touchdown and the two-point conversion. I really was didn't think they'd get the touchdown. And so I was on the phone with my dad when they scored. And I, he was like, yeah, I was like, I'm watching Oklahoma UCF. I was like, well, that game's over. And he's like, oh no, UCF and whatever. And then he's like, oh, they scored a touchdown. And then when he kind of like was confused on what happened on the two point conversion, uh, I was like, yeah, that makes sense for them. I, that's just, I mean, UCF missed their chance for a pretty significant win there. And unfortunately for them, I mean, they are at least going to have some opportunities if they still think that they can be a bowl eligible team. And it's not out of the realm of possibility because maybe John Rice Plumley being out has been a hefty part of their problems, but they have probably the easiest schedule in terms of what we perceive the talent they face to be in the big 12. It's West Virginia, Cincinnati, Oklahoma state, Texas tech, and Houston. They could mm-hmm. still get there, especially if, you know, you, I mean, three, they, Three of those games seem very winnable to UCF right now. I think UCF might be better than Cincinnati Tech and Houston. So we'll just yeah. kind of have to, to monitor it and see. Uh, Fan, what were you going to say on, on UCF? Well, Oklahoma? I was going to I was going to go back to my Oklahoma State point just because I oh, looked yeah. it up. They, they do play Oklahoma and Bedlam, but the other four games are against the four newcomers, Cincinnati, UCF, Houston, and BYU. Who made that so. schedule? I mean – So I, I knew – I knew because going back to my preseason schedule ranking – thing I did I think Oklahoma State had the second or third easiest since they had the easiest schedule in the Big 12 and look at them but <laughs> Oklahoma State had one of the easier schedules in the league and now what's really coming for I mean if they somehow win Bedlam they are going to be in Arlington almost yeah. certainly they which is pretty I mean, crazy they I'm going to say this for Oklahoma State people they deserve it for uh I mean we talk about how bad K-State was and how lopsided some of their series are yeah, the Bedlam series always blows my mind, and I will give Oklahoma State credit. In the two years that they absolutely had to win that game, they did twenty eleven and twenty twenty one. But it would be very funny if this was the year that they actually won a game that they weren't supposed to in that mm-hmm. series. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll we'll have to see. Uh, we won't talk about Baylor Cincinnati again, just because <laughs> you know, gross, whatever. Um, 
But if there are any any big thoughts on Houston, Texas, those are welcome because I've been on this for a little bit, and I thought you know the KU game, Texas still ended up blowing them out, but I thought Texas showed some warts there mm-hmm. that started to make me think that they weren't invincible. And then obviously, you know, they they didn't go out and handle Oklahoma, which again, Oklahoma is a good team this year, so it's not like the expectation should have been for them to win by fifteen, but they. They didn't play up to par to start that game and everything else. Uh, Texas is starting to look more and more like the same old Texas and be a gettable team, and it makes what K-State could do going down there in two weeks much more manageable at this point because as good as Houston's offense is starting to do some things and they have some playmakers, there's no reason why Texas should have only won by a touchdown yesterday Mm -hmm. because Quinn Ewers – he did not get hurt in the first quarter. It was later in that game. So, I mean, he played essentially the full game, and they still only, only won by seven. Yeah, and then how how serious is that injury? I mean, the dude's in a yeah. sling. Seems like that seems pretty significant. But and then what do they do if he's out? I mean, uh, is 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 Manning going to be in play now? Hmm. So, I mean, I think I I like Malik Murphy, or I like the thought of him, but. <laughs> If he like if he were to struggle next week, I mean, you gotta you gotta go with Arch. I mean, come yeah. on, K State versus Arch Manning, that would be the uh, that would be a massive matchup for everybody. How how wild would that be if in a three day stretch, K State would face the nephew of Peyton and Eli Manning, and then two days later the basketball team faces LeBron James's kid? Like that would be just you know the cats at the center of the sports universe. <laughs> That's right. I think that the most surprising thing about uh, Texas Houston is that Texas wasn't able to run the ball very well. They only had 141 rushing yards against one of the worst rushing defenses in the, in the league. So I, it it just does smell a lot like the OU game where Texas just thought that they could pull in and win. Mm-hmm. And they did just enough to win, just like Oklahoma did. Oh, this will be a question for you, fan. And if you don't have the numbers on you, that's all right because I'm springing it on you. But it feels like to me that if that that rushing production is probably more so because Texas seems like in what I've seen this year, while the rushing game has been successful at times, it feels like it's based more on just like massive explosive plays as opposed to you know continuously getting four to five yards a carry or something like that where it's just like we don't have an answer for these guys it's more so stop 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 big run stop 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 big run i mean that's what the ku game was like it texas was just making that jonathan brooks would bust one off every once in a while so maybe you have some more stats to back that up because i think we want to differentiate here well maybe two things is houston's run defense that good to where we should be concerned about that next week for k-state and then on the flip side two weeks from now I mean, where does the the level of concern lie for what K-State might face with the Texas offense running the ball? Well, number one, Houston's run de- defense is not good. Okay. I would I would call them All right, that makes me feel better. The third worst in the Big 12 behind that was going into this week behind only ahead of only KU and UCF. Um, and then the Texas run offense um, okay. Success rate, their rush success rate, you're right on on their big playability. Their rush success rate going into this week was number 90 in the country, and their rush explosiveness was number 11 okay. going into the, the game. And they ended up only 3.8 yards per carry on top of what you know Drew mentioned. They didn't rush it very well. 3.8 is not very good against a defense that wasn't very good against the run. So I, you know, it would be interesting to see what the story is behind that because – that is a pretty significant difference than what you would expected. <clears throat> the Texas run game that didn't look like with 3.8 yards per carry. That that also means they probably didn't have too many big runs either. So, yeah, that is a pretty good storyline. Uh, and and looking at what K State is going to be able to do against that Houston rush defense next week. Well, and the K and K State should be well prepared defensively for Texas because that's what the defense does. They stop, stop, stop. Give up a massive play yeah. and. That's how teams have moved the ball against K-State this year. So uh, K-State's been preparing for the Texas game unknowingly all season long. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Joe Klanderman should know exactly what's coming there. Uh, any final thoughts on that game or takeaways, Drew? 
Uh, something also to kind of keep in mind for next week is that uh, Jonathan Brooks had eight catches against mm-hmm. Houston. So maybe maybe that's another big running back catch game. Maybe Houston doesn't know that that's also legal. Man, <laughs> the, the touchdown that DJ Giddens had, I just it blew my mind that he scored on that play. Not because I don't think that DJ Giddens has the ability to score on a play like that, but mainly because I didn't think that Big 12, as bad as Big 12 defenses once were, I didn't think that they had the inability to not stop a play from like that from happening for that much yardage. But, uh, no, nope, TCU was not with it. Uh, final game of the night outside of K-State and TCU was BYU-Texas Tech. BYU jumped out to a pretty big lead, and they led that game 24-7 uh, to at halftime. And then there were only uh, two scores in the second half, a field goal by BYU and a touchdown in the fourth quarter by Tech that put them down by 13. And I I already alluded to it. Jake Strong had a terrible night for Texas Tech. Uh, You know, we thought that last week was bad. He was 19 of 37 for 236 yards, a touchdown, three more interceptions, and a QBR of 19.1. Taj Brooks was fine, but he had to do it on a lot of carries. I mean, he was only 3.4 yards a carry, and he had 105 yards in the game. So it did not come easy for Texas Tech last night in Provo. And Texas Tech, we said if they went there and lost that game, they would be in serious jeopardy of not making it to a bowl game this year. And now, based off the way they played, it seems very likely. They have TCU uh, next week, or actually two weeks from now, and then they have KU on the road, UCF at home, and at Texas. There, there's just n- – I don't see any way this team is getting to six wins because they will lose on the road in Lawrence and Austin. I No matter what KU team is playing, if it's Jalen Daniels KU or Jason Bean KU, Jason Bean cannot make enough mistakes to lose to this current version of Texas Tech. So uh, it this is going to be quite the uh, offseason for Joey McGuire's crew to face. Yeah, you you said last week that the Texas Tech message boards wondered if Jake Strong was yeah. colorblind. I wonder if that. Out. Yeah, I wonder if that's. Yeah, I wonder if that's a thing again. Uh, six yeah. quarters throwing six interceptions. I mean, he's efficient. Or one, one, one a quarter. Let's just. I think you could drop the color from that <laughs> phrase. He may just be blind. Uh, uh, that's not nice of me to say. He's he is an eighteen year old man. He's an adult. I we should be nicer to these eighteen year old adults. Uh, I, I always think, you know, I, I'm getting older, so I'll probably start referring to them as kids more, but I have a brother that's 18 years old and a freshman in college right now. And if he did something stupid, I would think, yeah, you're an idiot for doing something stupid. I wouldn't be like, well, you're still learning, dude. Like it, it's okay. You got some time to figure out now. So, uh, I'm, I, you know, you don't have to be over the top, but I have no sympathy for like criticism towards college athletes in a lot of situations. So, uh, I don't feel bad for saying that Jake Strong is blind. So come at me, you know, anybody that wants to try and step up and stand up for for Mr. Red Raider pick thrower. Um, but yeah, you can yeah. you guys can continue. I'll go I'll go scout out some good some gold from the Texas Tech message boards. Uh, I'll yeah. say that it also wasn't just him because Taj Brooks had a fumble that was a scoop and score. Yeah. I think Miles Price had a fumble. They they've had eight turnovers the last two games. Uh, it's it's when it goes bad, it goes bad. You know, it this this might be a, a bad year for tech. Oh, hey, hey, you guys want some gold here? All right. Taj Brooks appreciation thread, uh, which is odd considering that he had a bad fumble in yesterday's game. But this was this was started an hour and a half ago on Sunday morning. So this guy is uh finished it off. And the first reply is would like to see him in K State's offense. So Taj. <laughs> The portal is open, and I have no doubt that you know Chris Kleiman has found a way to manage two good running backs. He has room for a third. I think he could figure it out with the three of you guys next year. So you know, if that's not me saying that, that is Texas Tech fans saying that. So come home, son. Last time I heard uh, a, a a beat writer or a guy calling for a guy to transfer, that was Texas. In Deuce yeah. Vaughn, so I Jeff don't know, Mason. Up. You might watch it. You're going to get attacked. I'm not calling for him to transfer. I'm just <laughs> echoing the sentiment of Texas Tech fans. You know, if if they're saying it about their guy, I'm just getting it out to the masses. I'm trying to be a megaphone for 
their message. I want it to get to more people. Fair enough. Fair enough. But yeah, the, the you, your point about turnovers, if you go minus five on turnovers on the road, you probably are not going to win. And th- that could say something more about BYU that they only won by 13. Oh, it definitely says something about BYU. Five turnovers. <laughs> It definitely says something about BYU to have five to force five turnovers. Your defense scored on one of them, and you still only put up twenty seven points. But I also saw I think Keaton Slovis only had like one hundred and twenty nine passing yards. BYU is not good. Hey, they are five and two, two and two, tied with the Kansas Jayhawks in the Big Twelve. So <laughs> the, the most fraudulent five and two I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, look, I had I had a theory that maybe. The, the schedule was going to work out to where the Big 12 was just going to try and get every team bowl eligible. Uh, still a chance that I would give it to like 12 of 14 teams. I don't think Cincinnati is going to do it. And no. Texas Tech, in theory, could. But with Jake Strong at quarterback, it's just not going to happen. But yes, uh, it is funny to look right now and see that the Big 12 has one, two, three, four, five, six. That's great audio hearing somebody count. <laughs> Uh, they have six teams that have two losses or less right now, which is a nice change of pace for the Big 12, considering you know past years where if this was the regular Big 12 the last decade, you'd have a handful of teams with a bunch of losses already because they would have had to have played each other. And now we're kind of seeing where you know the SEC got mm. propped up all these years. We think this is the – I mean, fans been with it a lot more – a lot longer than Drew and I have, so – you know, you that can, was low key you, shots at calling him kind of old. No, 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 no. I'm just saying he, he's, you know, his, his memory bank and knowledge will be a lot better than ours on this. But <laughs> in my lifetime, like, I feel like this is one of the worst seasons the Big 12 could have in terms of talent and, and teams that are actually good. And yet we're looking at this six teams less than two losses. And this is exactly what the SEC has done forever is they've had 14 teams, they avoid playing each other a bunch. And so at the end of the year, you're looking around and you got a bunch of teams that are no worse than seven and five. And the Big 12 is reaping those benefits this year. And it's only going to get worse next year when there's 16 teams. And you're going to be able to separate a lot more because we see right now that there is a defined top of this league where, you know, the top six is there because of how they've played in some fashion. But then also like a team like BYU who we don't think should be five and two in any other circumstance, but they are. So it's it's significant and something to monitor. All right, uh, just so we can kind of you know keep this thing moving on at a better pace and get close to the end. This was the final big topic I wanted to get to, and it plays off of the Big Twelve and what we've seen now. Is K State a legit Big Twelve contender? Can they actually get back to Arlington? Is that not just a well? You could do it if this happens. Is it a true? We should start seriously thinking hey, they should expect to go into Austin and compete and have a legitimate chance to win that game. And if they do that, then they absolutely should be the team in Arlington facing likely Oklahoma. So uh, this is a big topic. This is People are going to be on you one way or the other, Drew, so I'll let you start with it. Uh, I mean, I, I feel like the answer has to be yes because, I mean, you beat Houston, you're 4-1 and one in the league going to Austin, which is, they, they were 4-1 and one going into the Texas game last year. So I, I feel like, the answer has to be yes, because uh, I mean, you said it. You beat Texas. I I don't know if there's another loss on the schedule if you if you were to win that game, with how the league looks right now and how the schedule plays out. I mean, K State only leaves the state of Kansas once in the next month to end the season, so I, I feel like it has to be yes. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. You have clearly at this point definitively the third best team in the metrics um, in K-State. Top 20-ish team probably this week after it's all said and done. Texas and Oklahoma will probably remain in the top 10 in the metrics. So you have that going for you. Uh, You have one of the best offenses in the league, second or third best offense, probably the third, fourth-ish best defense in the league. So you're going to have opportunities to get there. You don't play Oklahoma, which is unfortunate, but um, you do get Texas. You got to go there. Um, can can K State get off that kind of losing streak we've had against the Longhorns, which you know we used to live, love to 
talk about how we own Texas for a while, and we did, but in, in football we have not for a while. So is this the year they can finally get over that hump against Texas as they're leaving the league and put themselves in real contention? But it's, it's going to be about that game in two weeks. Uh, yeah, not that I, I'm overlooking Houston. I think I'm not ready to say that it, they are a legit Big 12 contender. Mathematically, they are <laughs> legitimately in it. But, you know, you, you got to go out and at least finish off Houston next week. And then from there, like, we're not really going to know if <clears throat> the, the quarterback problems have been settled or whatever else is plaguing them, if that's actually gone away. They're going to have to go to Texas and actually compete. And, I mean, it's – I don't know. It's probably a cop out of me to say it because we won't know if they're a legit Big 12 contender or not in my eyes until they go down and have to beat Texas essentially to do it. Because if they lose to Texas, then the math would say there's really not a, a realm in which they get there unless Texas, you know, falls apart and some of these other teams do. But I just I don't think that we've although they're playing better and we can see that and it there are some elements that are working, we just don't really know what they're going to look like until they play Texas and Houston next week probably won't tell us. I mean, if anything, Houston could give us signs that they're not there, even if they win that game. So uh, I'm not going to say that they are a legit Big 12 title game contender yet, and it's all just going to ride on how they play down in Austin. But once they go down there, and if they were to win that game, then they are back into the the co-captain's chair uh, with, with Oklahoma, and we'll just have to monitor it moving forward. All right. Uh, one final thing that we'll do before we just quickly get our question of the weekend. Uh, Drew, I'll let you you go on this real quick. A little recruiting roundup. A lot of big visitors there yesterday. Uh, any significant news uh, on, on that or notes that you should share with everybody? Uh, yeah, just a lot of visitors. Um, there were four official visitors. Boone Morris from Texas. Uh, Jacques Bradley Demps from Texas. J. Sean Ross from the Kansas City area and uh Callan Barta from Topeka. Um all four of those guys were chatting it up with other commits with the coaches. They'll probably be leaving soon. It's like 9:45ish on Sunday, so they'll probably be leaving sooner than later uh because they only got 48 hours on officials. Um there are a lot of big 2025 guys that were there. Um uh, Jack Lang is an offensive lineman. That's a four star that was there. Um a lot of 2025 guys that got offered while they were there. A lot of 2026 guys that got offered while they were there. It was honestly probably the biggest recruiting weekend that uh, in the Chris Kleiman era because of the amount of talent that was all in one area. I think I said that it might have been the only thing that might have been close was when Avery Johnson took an unofficial visit uh, for the Iowa State game in 21. But um, I, I think that it was the biggest weekend that they've had. I mean, I, I've i just been looking at my phone uh, while we've been recording, and I, I've, every, like, two or three minutes, I'll get, like, I'll just look down, and it'll say uh, on Twitter, X, whatever the heck you want to call it. It'll I'll just, like, look down, and it'll just say 20-plus notifications. So, I mean, I think it was a successful weekend. They saw a great game. The atmosphere was really good uh it was something that like my parents and i talked about afterwards was when you have a game like that it's hard for the crowd to stay in it because it was a blowout but the crowd was in it the whole game and i'm excited to see kind of where this weekend uh goes because i i think that uh people say that they want the red banner uh for a new commit and i think that you might see some red banners soon mm. all right start counting them up We'll have we'll have Drew count them next week. Like I counted teams with less than three losses in the Big Twelve for everybody. This just comes be, becomes a counting show. All right, uh, one question for next week. Uh, it can it can be pretty quick. You can just throw it out there and let it sit with everybody. Uh, fan, what is your question for next week against Houston? I mean, I'd say can K State avoid a hiccup overlooking a Houston with Texas looming on the the horizon and and not have that bad game that gets the fans I, th I mean i think we can play bad and still win but then the fans get all excited and worked up and wonder what's going on so uh hope can we avoid that hiccup game uh i'll say was was the last three <coughs> of the the defense was that a legit thing in the the new defense kind of going forward or are they going to revert back to how they were to start the year because Houston is an explosive offense. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I will go to the, the, the position that everybody's most concerned about, quarterback. And my question is just, you know, can Will Howard officially reclaim this job? I mean, there is a realm where, like fans say, K-State can play bad and still beat Houston. But within that, getting a win, it can still look really bad for Will Howard. And all the questions come back. And then it's a massive decision for Chris Kleiman and Colin Klein going to Austin. So you just need Will Howard to go out and play a clean game and be precise and dominate essentially like he did yesterday. Both quarterbacks dominated TCU in different ways, and uh, you need Will Howard to be able to do that next week because, again, I truly believe that K-State's peak this season can only be hit if it is Will Howard at quarterback. Avery Johnson can get him close to that, but Will Howard, with how he played last year, if you get that out of him, you're in a pretty good position if you're K-State. You just need him to get back to that level. We'll see if he keeps inching closer next week against Houston. That will do it for us on the KSO Show this Sunday. For Drew Galloway and KSU underscore fan, I'm Mason Voth. Follow along with everything we got going at K-State Online. Head over to On3. Get signed up if you're not already a member to get all those great recruiting updates from Drew for all the big visitors. Also great game coverage and team coverage throughout the week. And then uh, we will be back next Sunday. D.Y. and I with everybody on Monday to tie a bow on TCU and get prepped for the Houston Cougars.